Welcome back to What You Will Learn and welcome to 2022. My name is Adam Ashton. My name is Adam Jones. Happy New Year, everybody. Happy New Year. As always, we thought we'd do a book to kick off the year to be in line with a lot of people's New Year's resolutions and I think a lot of people out there want to make a bit more money in 2022. I think it's not uncommon, is it? Yeah, I'd say probably what health, diet, fitness is probably one bucket and then money is probably the other bucket that probably can capture 90% of all New Year's resolutions, I reckon. That's it and we'll get to a few of those in, in the next books that are coming. So today in this episode, we're covering The Psychology of Money by Morgan Housel. Timeless Lessons on Wealth, Greed and Happiness. So Big Morgs, when he was studying uh, at college, he was working a little job as well. He was working in a nice hotel in LA and one of the frequent guests was this tech executive who was this so-called genius. He designed uh, some kind of patented technology that took off and he just made a shitload of money uh, and he had built and sold a whole bunch of companies as well. So uh, safe to say, he was kind of rolling in it. He was rolling in it and he was a bit like a rich wanker, you could say as well, because he had he carried stacks of $100 bills, several inches thick and he wanted everyone to see it and know all about <laughs> it, didn't he? So he bragged about it all the time when he was at the bar. One day, he went up and smashed this $500 lamp, which must have been a pretty good lamp for 500 That's bucks. That's an expensive lamp, yeah. You have to replace it. And Morgan, he said, went up to him and said, come on, mate, you got to replace this. And uh, he said incredulously, you want 500 bucks? He just pulled out his lot of cash and said, here's 5,000 bucks, mate. Now, get out of my face, piss off, and never insult me again like that. <sighs> Sounds like a nice sort of a bloke to hang around with. Yeah. <laughs> He's got a hell of a lot of money, but it sounds like not a hell of a lot of anything else. But then, uh, as it turns out, a few years later, he didn't have a hell of a lot of money anymore. He went bust. He went broke. He <laughs> lost it all. So, picture this bloke. Rich douchebag, we'll call him. Compare it to a uh, little superstar. We'll call him Superstar Ronald. He's, <laughs> and in uh, Wikipedia, it says, Ronald James Reed was an American philanthropist, investor, janitor, and gas station attendant. <laughs> the first two don't really seem to fit with the second two, do they? No. You wouldn't normally expect a janitor and a gas station attendant to also be an investor and a philanthropist. But actually, it turns out that when poor uh, poor Ronnie Reed, when he died in 2014, he'd made it to 92, so good innings. Uh, but this humble rural janitor, he made international headlines because it turns out that he was just sitting on a couple of million when he when he died. And his his neighbors were baffled. They were like, this just little, little old dude Wrong. who's... A, just cleans the floors? Ronald. He's got a couple of mil. <laughs> <laughs> Bizarre. And a philanthropist saving the world. So, <laughs> absolutely baffled. And what he did was there was no lottery. There was no inheritance. Uh, he didn't get the, the lucky gene pool or anything like that. Throughout his life, he just had the right habits. He saved what he could and he invested in blue chip stocks consistently and applied a few principles we're going to look at in this episode. So, it's, it's kind of crazy that someone with no college degree, no training, no background, no formal experience, no connections, no fancy job, no big salary, outperformed this guy who was supposedly this tech genius who'd built and sold companies and uh, was just this all-round superstar who later went broke. Mm. So, financial success, it's not a hard science. It's more like a soft skill where how you behave is more important than what you know and what you've learned in the past. And this soft skill is what Big Morgan, the author, calls the psychology of money. Got a story here which is in a lot of books. I think uh, me and Ash will just say, I think it was in our book, but we gave it the chop, I think, in editing think. because it was in every bloody book. <laughs> something to do with money. It's not, it's not the uh, Mexican fisherman, uh, but it's not too far behind in terms of uh, frequency of, of how often it appears in books. No, absolutely not. So it's the story of Kurt, Big Kurt, and... Uh, there's a quote here. At a party given by a billionaire on Shelter Island, Kurt Vonnegut informs his pal Joseph Haller that their host, the hedge fund manager, had made more money in a day than Joseph's wildly popular book, Catch-22, made it in its entire history. And of course, Joseph, the wise man, he replied, yes, but I've got something this bloke's never going to have. And that's enough. Oof. There you go. It's, it's probably why it gets in a lot of books because it is a good banger. It but, is. Uh, you can have as much as you want uh, and still never have enough, which is kind of crazy. Let's look at another another bloke, uh, Raj Gupta. He was born in Calcutta. He was orphaned as a teenager. Uh, the metaphor is that the privileged people, they begin life on third base and it's not far to get to home base and be a success. Well, uh, Gupta, by comparison, he couldn't even see the stadium. It wasn't even on the horizon. That's how far away he was from third base. So, from those beginnings in Kolkata, in the slums, where he went to, it was absolutely phenomenal. So, by his mid-40s, 
Gupta was the CEO of McKinsey. This is the world's most prestigious consulting firm. And he retired in 2007 to take on roles within the UN. So, he ended up being a world leader, uh, essentially. Yeah. Uh, And with that uh, career success came massive financial success and wealth as well. By 2008, he was sitting on 100 million. So, that's a fair, fair chunk of change. And at that point... Really, he could have done anything he wanted in life. There's pretty much nothing you can't do with $100 million. Um, But, there's a big but, of course. Raj, he wasn't content with being a center millionaire because all the mates he was hanging out with, they were billionaires. And he thought, well, I've got $100 mil, but I want $1,000 mil. I want to become a billionaire. You know, I want to come say that I went from the slums to, to the billionaire world. And that's sort of what he wanted really, really badly. So, in 2008, Raj, he was on the board of Goldman Sachs. And they were staring down the wrath of the GFC. So, things were turning to shit on the board and they were having some pretty wild meetings. They got a call one day. It was Warren Buffett. Mm. He wanted to invest $5 billion into the bank to help it survive. So, the board, this is some big news. And Massive. you could imagine the share market thinking, all right, they're going to go down to the go down to Gurgler. Yeah. Big Warren is going to save the day and <laughs> we know right. we're going to get through this. <laughs> so, what Raj did, he was on that... Uh, there was obviously a very privileged information. That was just the very first beginnings of that uh, where, where Big Woz was on the call and said, guys, I'm going to chuck a, chuck a few billion to save the bank. And Raj was in that board meeting with just a, a handful of people, one of the, the very smallest handful of people that knew. And uh, Raj, straight away, 16 seconds later, he, he hung up that, that conference call. That's a man who gets shit and he done, was, isn't it? He was straight onto, straight onto the other phone, the, uh, the private number, I'm guessing, the burner. Called up his broker and says, uh, "Let's can I buy a few shares in uh, in Goldman because I reckon there's some there's going to be some nice nice uh, nice news just on the horizon." And so he loaded up. He bought 175,000 shares in Goldman Sachs, and he made his quick 17 million dollars off this investment. You know, getting on the on the way to his goal of yeah. being a billion dollars. Just very quickly from this one phone call, he's gone from 100 to 117. So he's not far off. Absolutely. You know, he's on the way. Well, the only issue is he ended up in prison <laughs> yeah, that's right. for insider trading. So, it's not a good news story, the no. story about Raj. Well, it was until that point, I yeah. guess. Yeah, he got busted, obviously. You can't be doing that. That's literally the definition of insider trading and uh, and the SEC, they got him. So, why the hell would someone, if you got got 100 million bucks in the bank, why would you break the law and risk yourself going to jail and lose it all for more money? just for the sake of getting to that social comparison of a billion dollars. Yeah. Yeah, it's a bit crazy. And, and Buffett, actually, there's a quote from Big Woz. He's got to put this pretty succinctly. There is no reason to risk what you have and need for what you don't have and don't need. So, obviously, he has a shitload of money. He has his freedom, but he risked <laughs> he risked his freedom for something that he didn't need, which was just an extra couple of mil, which really wouldn't have made a hell of a lot of difference. It might seem like the Gupta story isn't that relevant to you, I mean, he's worth $100 million in the bank. Most of the listeners, out, let's say a good majority of listeners don't have $100 million in the bank. But a measurable percentage of everyone listening, including ourselves, at some point in our lives, we're probably going to earn a salary or a sum of money sufficient to cover like every reasonable thing that we actually need and a lot of the things mm. that we actually want in life. And if you know if someone's listening right now and you're one of those people who you've got probably enough money just to get the shit that you actually need, there's a few things we can remember. One important thing is to realize that the hardest financial skill is just to get the goalposts to stop moving. Uh, they're always going to be shifting. That uh, You line up for your shot, you kick that goal, all of a sudden you're going to find that the goalposts have shifted a little bit and you're going to have to strive a little bit harder, uh, work a little bit harder, try a little bit more, do a little bit, maybe get that side hustle where you, you find out about uh, Warren Buffett, throw, throw a sneaky couple of trades in. And realize that, well, those goalposts, if you're going to try and hit those that next goal, then you're going to have to do some of these things. But obviously, it's very important to stop those goalposts from moving. Yeah, for, for the Gupta man, um, his goalposts were rising from the slums in Calcutta. So, it's a very good thing to have an ambition to a Definitely. point of comfort, maybe yeah. a mil, but at 100 mil, God, come on, man, you've <laughs> the, kicked a pretty good goal there. Yeah. He kept moving them all along. It's the same for all of us, right? Like... Uh, it, at a certain point, we got to be satisfied with what we've got. Yeah, it's it's uh, dangerous when you get that taste for more. You know, maybe when that when the you say when that dog gets their first taste of blood, that's a that's a very bad thing. For if you get that taste of more, more money, more power, more prestige, and that uh, ambition is just for more, 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 then you're in a, in for a world of hurt. Which brings us to the next point, and that is social comparison. That's the real problem here. If you consider a rookie baseball player, they've just entered the roster on 500 grand a year. A lot of money, right? He's 
probably the definition of rich. He's kicking ass. But he plays on the same team as a bloke called Mike Trout. He's on a 12-year, $430 million contract. By comparison, you're only on 500 <laughs> grand a year, so you're pretty broke compared to uh, old Mike. But then uh, Mike, so Mike, he's got his 430 mil 12-year contract, so he's making 36 million a year, which is an insane amount of money. But then when he goes to parties, uh, when he hangs out with his his mates who are working as a this big hedge fund manager, he found that in order to try and crack the ranks of those top 10 highest paid hedge fund managers in the world, then you need to be making $340 million a year. So Mike, with his just he's only got 36 mil a year. So he's thinking, oh man, I'm broke. I'm broke. <laughs> I'm broke. Well, the hedge fund manager that he's got to be in the presence at a party with, he went to another party and you know he's making $340 million a year. And uh, he found that the other top hedge fund managers, the top five, they're on about $770 million a year. That, that, that they go home, they go home with their good. partner thinking they're pretty broke as well, don't they? <laughs> That's right. And then, and then that the top hedge fund manager they looked at Warren Buffett, and in one year, Warren Buffett made three point five billion dollars. So they're nowhere near the realms of the Buffett man. And Buffett, he could look at Jeff Bezos, whose net worth increased by twenty four billion dollars in two thousand eighteen, and Bezos here. Twenty-four billion in two thousand eight. He, he made more per hour than the rich baseball player made in a full year. Yeah, there you go. All of a sudden, that thirty-six mil a year isn't looking so good if you're looking up to the likes of Bezos. So the point is, the ceiling of social comparison is so high that virtually no one is ever going to hit it. So it's something that's always going to be with you unless you find a way to actually get satisfied and remove this social comparison away from your life because it's actually one of the things that undermines wealth building in its entirety. So the only way to win is to not fight this battle to begin with. You need to get rid of this social comparison game and accept that you might have enough right now, even if it's less than the people who are around you because mm-hmm. the people around you, there's always going to be someone who's, um, who's kicking longer goals from 57 out. No one is impressed with your possessions as much as you are. It's an interesting one. You got to just sort of sit with that for a little bit. Well, Big, you, I think it was the same. If you if you um, buy a whopper, whatever that might be, you go home pretty happy with yourself. But no one is no, happy. No, as really cares. Like, no one else gives a shit. <laughs> Morgan, uh, he, um, I don't know if this was at the the hotel he used to work at or a different job, but he used to work as a valet, and it was his dream to have one of these cars because he was always parking someone's Ferrari or Lamborghini or Rolls Royce, and he always thought that these types of you know, these massive luxury cars, they kind of send a really strong signal to others. They say that you made it, you're smart, you're rich, you have taste, you're important, look at me, look at me, look at me. So he thought, I want one of these as well. Of course, but the irony is that he never actually looked at the drivers. You're just looking at the car the whole time. (laughs) Because when you see someone driving a nice car, you really think, wow, that person driving the car, look at him with his sunglasses, he's pretty damn cool. But you don't think that at all. You think, Hey, if I had that car, people would think I'm cool. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> you kind of skip the bit about actually thinking that person's cool and you just picture yourself there. Uh, and so, you're only looking at the car, never at the person. So, the paradox here is that we kind of want to send that signal to others. We want to send out that signal that we're rich or that we should be liked and admired. But in reality, they don't admire you. They just then picture themselves being rich and admired and liked and thinking, oh, man, I want to buy that car one day for myself. So Morgan says wealth is what you don't see. And here's another interesting quote. He's good at his old poetic Mm. quotes, Morgan, I'd say. But he says here, spending money to show people how much money you have is the fastest way to have less money. (laughs) That's right. That's right. You see someone driving a $100,000 car, I guess you can kind of think, yeah, they're probably wealthy to be able to afford that car. But really, the only data point you've got about their wealth is that they actually have $100,000 less than the day before uh, that they bought the car. Yeah, that's essentially all you know about them, hey? <laughs> so we, we tend to judge wealth by what we see and it's probably the wrong way to go about it. But we do it this way, it's because that's the information we've got in front of us. They're rolling in with a Lambo, they're rolling in with a nice car. But what you can see is the car, the home, the Instagram photos, but you really can't see their bank account or their brokerage statements. So we're really using these mm. outward appearances to gauge their financial success. Really, the best thing to know uh, or the, the best thing that makes somebody wealthy is all the cars that they didn't buy because that means that's, that's money still in their wealth or all the diamonds they didn't buy, the watches they don't wear, the, the, uh, the first class upgrade that they didn't take and instead save that money. Of course, our mate, the gas station attendant, he didn't buy a lot of things and that's how he ended up being a philanthropist with a few mil in the bank. 
There's another funny story. Singer Rihanna, obviously a very successful career, made a hell of a lot of money. There was one point where she was almost bankrupt and uh, just from her lavish overspending, uh, going to the clubs, buying the most expensive stuff, buying the most expensive clothes, uh, cars, jewelry, everything. And she ended up suing her financial advisor hmm. because she said, well, you're my financial advisor. How come I'm broke? And he said, well, was it really that necessary for me to tell you that if you spend money on things, then you end up with all the things and none of the money? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, crazy rhetorical <laughs> question sort of thing, but I mean, not to a lot of people because people need to be told this lesson really. And, and this is because when most people say they want to be a millionaire, a lot of the time they are actually saying, I'd like to spend a million dollars and mm. have a million dollars worth of things. Mm. And that is literally the opposite of being a millionaire. <laughs> That's right. So you don't have a million bucks in the bank. You got a million ducks worth of shit. Worth of shit that you don't probably need. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But it, that is pretty interesting. Yeah, I think if if people want to be a millionaire, it's probably because they want to buy the shit and do the shit that they think will make them feel like a millionaire, hmm. and then you don't have any of the money anymore. So the kick through all this is choosing to save money as opposed to choosing to use money to spend on things. And as we're rolling into 2022, I think it's a good goal to actually shift our focus onto the saving money because it's a really hmm. important idea. Yeah, big time. He says that building wealth, yes, obviously income and maybe investment returns, they're, they're pretty important. But really, the, the most important thing and the thing that's really within your control is your savings rate. If you can spend less and save more, it doesn't really matter what that income is. If your percentage of whatever you bring in, you're saving a higher percentage, then you're moving in the right direction. So, let's say if you've read some of the best investment books of all time, like Ashto's favorite, One Up on, on Wall Street. Oh, yeah. What a cracker. And after reading that book, you're getting 12% on your returns from um, <laughs> investing in his legs and his other weird and wacky <laughs> investments and all that. If you kick an ass at 12% and someone else who's read a, uh, The Intelligent Investor and you're just doing the old boring passive income, I'm being um, ironical here, <laughs> yeah. and you're only earning 8%. Obviously, the 12% earner is much better than the 8% and you think that that 12% earner is going to make all the money in the world and kick ass, especially over time compounded. Definitely. But then the real kicker here is if that person who's earning only earning 8%, which is still pretty solid, but if they're only earning 8%, if they actually need half as much money to be happy with their life and happy with their lifestyle, that actually can compound your assets even faster because if that person who's making 12% is spending a hell of a lot of that, whereas the person who's the worst uh, quote unquote investor only make an eight percent, but they're saving a hell of a lot more. They can actually be in front in the end. So learning to be happy with less money creates a gap between what you have and what you want, and similar to the gap you get from your growing paycheck, it's but easier and it's in your control. So by snipping out this social comparison out of your life and not buying all the shit you don't need, it doesn't matter if your investment you know you don't have to read every book to try and get that slightly extra few percentage points on your investment returns. It doesn't really mean much if you're actually increasing your savings rate as much as you possibly can. And one thing he says was that it's kind of easy if you've got a specific goal. He says if you're saving for a, a car, I know we hung shit on cars, but maybe you need a car or you're, you're saving for a house or you're saving for a holiday. If you're saving for a goal, people are good at saving. He says that what you need to get better at though is not saving for a goal, but saving when you don't have a goal, saving for the sake of saving. And we've kind of laid out the importance of, of saving here. So if you can shift that goal to just saving just because, if you don't have anything big on the horizon, but you can still save, then that's definitely what you want to be doing. I like it. I think the goal is a big one. I think yeah, if you're saving for a house or something like that, it, it is easy just to get around it and go hard on it. But just saving for an arbitrary, hey, I want to make you know, 10 grand this year or say put that away in the bank or something. Yeah, it is. I guess that goal needs to be there at the start, which sort of links to, to this year. So maybe not a bad idea to set that financial mm. goal for the year. And uh, this time next year when we're doing another financial goal, you can <laughs> say, hey, I've done it. Yeah, save for the sake of saving. In the early 1900s, Serbian scientists studied the Earth's position and came up with a theory of ice ages that we all know about today and it's very accurate. Turns out that the gravitational pull of the sun and the moon gently affect the Earth's motion and the tilt towards the sun by like a, such a slight amount. But during the, the parts of this cycle, over tens of thousands of years, each of the Earth's hemispheres gets either a tiny little bit more or a tiny little bit less solar radiation. So what creates ice ages is moderately cool summers, not the extremely cold winters as you might think. So it's all about when a summer never gets to a point where it's warm enough to melt the previous year's snow and the leftover ice makes it easier for the snow to accumulate the following winter. 
I mean, if you think about the freezing point of water to ice, all it is is zero degrees, right? So if you got one degrees, it's melting, and you're going to have uh, you know, have a whole bunch less snow. But if it's minus one degree throughout the summer, that's a very different story. So if you get that one slightly cool summer and you don't fully melt off all of the previous year's ice, what happens then is that little bit of ice, it makes it easier uh, the following winter to make a bit more ice and also the snow kind of reflects a bit more of the sun's rays, which means the following summer is probably going to be a little bit cooler as well. And all of a sudden, just from that one summer where you didn't quite get all of it, you left that one little millimeter of ice, it just perpetually uh, becomes more and more and more snow because it becomes easier the following year to make snow, becomes harder the following summer to melt that snow, which then makes it easier again the following winter to make more snow, so on, so on, so on. All of a sudden, the whole earth's covered in ice. That's it. So, the amazing thing here is how big something can grow from a very small change in conditions by just a margin of a few degrees Celsius. And this is where you start with a thin layer of snow uh, left over from a cool summer. And no one, you know, that year you think, hey, it's not, not a really big deal here, nothing to see. But then in a geological blink of an eye, then the entire world and earth is covered in miles of thick ice. <laughs> Obviously, we're talking the blink of an eye is like 10,000 years or so, but uh, that's pretty quick. In the, in, the, in the grand scale of things. But the big takeaway from Ice Ages here is that you don't need a tremendous amount of force to create these tremendous results. It starts with something very small, but then compounds over a very long time horizon. It's that little tiny thing that gives you that initial kick, that initial fuel for future growth that in the end seems to just defy logic. And the same thing happens with money as well. So when it comes to money, Warren Buffett is probably the classic archetype that we all think of when it comes to it. And there's 2,000 books around the world that are dedicated to how much of a superstar the Buff Man is and how he built his fortune. Many of the books are great. They're wonderful. Mm. But very few pay attention to the simplicity of how he actually did it. Because he didn't make his money because he was a good investor. He made his money because he was a good investor since he was a child. At the time of writing this book, Buffett, his net worth was $84.5 billion and uh, that's a lot of money but interestingly, $84.2 billion of that was made after his 50th birthday. So, it's taken him 50 years to go from zero to $0.3 billion, and then another, what? how old is he? Another 40 years to go from $0.3 billion all the way up to $84.5 billion. Yes, he's a superstar investor but his real success is just how bloody long he's been going at it for. That's right. That's right. If you get someone who gets Buffett's average returns and they invested from you know from their 30s through to their 60s, mm. they would have made a nice chunk of change, but they're not Warren Buffett level. Turns out that Warren Buffett, he started when he was like 10 and he's kept going well into his 80s. Let's think of this thought experiment on that one just to explore a bit further, Asho. So, we know he began when he was 10 years old. By the time he was 30 years old, he made his million bucks. It's good going. Yeah, so he was kicking ass then by the time he was 30, putting us to shame there, Astro, a bit, Mm. but that's all right. But let's say if he was just a bit more normal, doing it like we did, like most people do it, you spend your teens and your 20s exploring the world, you're finding your passion, you're traveling around a bit, you're saving money and you're doing things that you do. Um, And let's say by the time you're 30, you got about 25 grand, which is probably a bit more normal for people. Mm. So you got 25 grand in the bank compared to the million that the buff man had. And then say you've got that 25, uh, then you think, okay, let's get serious about my life. I'm going to put this money to work. I'm in you're my 30s to now. At 30 That's years right. old, you, you read a book and you, you turn to Buffett. Yep, you read, uh, what's that dude's name? Lynch? Peter, Peter Lynch. Lynch <laughs> one up on Wall Street. You one find that on one Street. that one massive investment because there was a big line out the front of the <laughs> shop. And then... <laughs> All of a sudden, you're making 22% annual returns. That's that's bloody crazy. Hmm. And then with those 22% compounded annually for 30 years, and you quit at age 60 because you think I've I've worked hard, I've made my money, time to you know play with the grandkids, time to hit the golf course, work on my golf game. I'm going to retire. At that point, you've done bloody well. 22% every year compounding for 30 years. You've gone. You've turned your 25k into 12 million dollars. So that's still pretty good. $12 million, but it's not Buffett, is it? No, it's still good. And this is at the age of 30. You just turn into a top 1% investor where you're making 22% returns per annum, but you don't have the value of the extended periods of time. If you think about our uh, ice age analogy, if you've just there for 30 years and uh, it's the, there's a little bit more snow, you're probably just seeing a bit more snow build up and it's not yeah. a big deal. Good ski season. Great yeah. ski season. You're loving life. <laughs> 
But over that time, when it compounds on itself, you're turning into the whole world being ice <laughs> and uh, you got no game to eat on and feed on. So, totally different planet you're living on if you utilize as much of the force's time as you possibly can. That's the thing. So, going from 30 to 60, you've made a decent amount of money. But Buffett's secret wasn't that he was this superstar investor. It was that when he started, when he was 10, and he's still investing into his late 80s. So, it's just a much different time horizon. And he's really getting those benefits of compounding way at the end when it gets really exponential. His skill is investing, but his secret is time. Mm. So, a lot of people out there have seen the compound interest table. If you've been listening for a while, it comes up in every single financial book that we've uh, or any sort of habit book or anything like that. And you hear the, the power of it, but it's very hard for us to intuitively grasp this because in our mind, we we typically think in linear thinking and mm. this exponential thinking doesn't really come easy. Yeah, and it's also we don't want to be thinking, you know, 70 years into the future either. We kind of want to get rich sooner rather than later. Mm. So, I guess the problem is if you're 30 or above, uh, you might be cooked. If you're a 10-year-old listening, then you can be buffered by the time you hit 90. So, get started basically. I don't know how many 10-year-olds are listening. Yeah, right in. <laughs> we had a couple of uh, youngins, but 10's pretty young, I guess. So, they say that of those uh, 2,000 books written all about Warren Buffett, how he made his money and his uh, you know superstar investing strategies that you can copy and replicate yourself and become a Buffett, he says you could probably scrap all those 2,000 books and write one book with just pretty much a title and maybe one page in it and all it needs to be the secret to Warren Buffett's $85 billion empire, shut up and wait. <laughs> and that one page is just a long-term chart of economic growth <laughs> over time and just showing the compounding on compounding and compounding. <laughs> so, you can't blame the people who want to put all their time and effort into trying to find those extra few percentage points and in investing and finding all the secrets. And you yourself, you might want to go out there and learn what they do and read all the books on it. And trying to earn the best investment returns possible. But good investing isn't necessarily about earning the highest returns because the highest returns tend to be the one-off hits that mm. you can never be repeated. So, you don't really have control on what investment returns you're going to have this year. What it's all about is earning pretty good returns and then sticking with a system that can be repeated for the longest period of time. So, longest period of time is the main point here when it comes to investing and making the big bucks. So, in summary, if you want to be like the millionaire janitor who was just living his humble means and his neighbors didn't even know that he was sitting on all his cash, then really the key is less ego, more wealth because saving money is the gap between your ego and your income. And wealth is what you don't see. So, wealth is created by suppressing what you could buy today in order to having more stuff and more options in the future. I think options is a mm. very big one, isn't it? Yeah, that's right. If you spend the money today to buy that fancy status symbol, then that's money that you don't have tomorrow to buy something else. Yeah, you could buy in the future, you could buy that fancy status symbol plus another fancy status <laughs> Two, symbol yeah, or, right. or quit your job and stick your finger up at the boss or something like that, which a lot of people want to do. So, no matter how much you earn, you're never going to build wealth unless you can put a lid on how much fun you can have with your money right now. Yeah, right now. Stick that's a lid a, on it. That's the key. I think it a key. Like Chuck a lid on it. No. Yeah. <laughs> and that's right. You, the single most powerful thing you can do is to increase your time horizon. Stop thinking about all the things you can buy now or next month or next year and think about building that long term wealth for down the track. That's it. So that's the psychology of money. Mm-hmm. 